Biographies in Art History The Role of Pathology in the Study of Artists The romanticized notion of the tortured artist is congruent with stories of mental disorders, infectious diseases, and physical disfigurement. This is not a new area of interest as evidenced by statements by Aristotle and, more recently, Oxford's Regis Professor of Medicine, Sir William Osler's 1919 statement, and I quote, The arts secrete materials that do for society what the thyroid does for human beings. The arts, including literature, music, painting, and sculpture are the hormones that enhance the increased human approach to the medical profession. As quoted by Wolf in 2005, when considering the impact of mental and physical illnesses effects on the lives and subsequently the works of artists, it is important to note that the impact is really a secondary concern. The primary concern to an art historian should be the artist's mental adaptation to compensate for these aberrations. This compensation adds to a divergent perception of reality and the need to express this perception. Laying the ground rules for a discourse on creativity and pathology. Creativity may be defined as finding novel solutions for a problem, although a creative approach is necessary for intellectual tasks. An intellectual approach is not necessary for creative tasks. Many creative tasks begin with the two-step process. In the first step, multiple solutions are devised without concern necessarily for practicality. This is known as divergent thinking. Secondly, these solutions are interpreted, selected, and realized. This is known as convergent thinking. The more random the potential solutions created in step one, the more need there is to select and sort these effectively, and this process is what makes up step two, according to Coslin in 2004. The right cerebral hemisphere makes constant far-reaching associations even when not working on a specific task consciously. This process of association building is called low latent inhibition, which could be called the positive side of a short attention span, according to Eisenach, 1995. In creative minds, thinking in analogies and the ability to distinguish and reorganize these influxes of input from their surroundings is paramount to success, according to Coslin in 2004. According to research, creativity and IQ contrast sharply. Unlike creativity, IQ has been noted to have a genetic component, and in contrast to IQ, Creativity is heavily influenced by exposure to environmental enrichment and experiences with others. Society encourages certain creative feats, and so these works are the areas most likely to be enhanced by that artist in the future. The amount of stress suffered does not relate to how creative an artist is, nor does acknowledgement of creative ability by others have an effect on their creative output. However, 
too much formal education or not enough formal education can stifle creative ability, according to Coslin in 2004. Is drug treatment for personality disorders possibly halting creativity? On the lecture circuit, Peter Kramer, a professor of Brown University, writes about responses to his 1993 book, Listening to Prozac. Initially, Kramer intended the book to deal with ideas concerning what he called cosmetic pharmacology, that is, people who weren't diagnosed as depressed or dysfunctional taking antidepressants to alter their personality traits and give them cheerful outer selves to be more successful at work. But that wasn't what audiences on the lecture circuit were interested in. The professionals in the field desired to know whether if medic medicine had found antidepressant drugs earlier, then the world might not have lost as many creative geniuses. In Denmark, they wanted to know what would have become of Soren Kierkegaard. In America, it was Edgar Allan Poe or Friedrich Nietzsche, or someone else drawn from a small list of 19th century artists, according to Kramer of 2005. What is the difference between a mental cure and a physical one? But the questions didn't stop at mental illness for Kramer. During a stay in Denmark, he pondered over the lifespan of Isaac Denison, the author of Out of Africa. This brought up the idea that physical disease is frequently treated very differently from mental disorders. No one would contest that offering antibiotics to Denison, a sufferer of syphilis, would have limited her suffering and thereby altered her creative endeavors. Why is the pharmacological treatment of a mental condition controversial? with regard to its outcome on creativity, while the treatment of a physical disease is not. Perhaps the creative impulse would remain intact, but it is possible the ideas expressed creatively might be much slower, shallower without the threat of mortality or of madness, according to Kramer of 2005. Is the eradication of epilepsy also eradicating alternate perception? An even more extreme question regarding the perception of treatment limiting creative individuals is furthered in the case of epilepsy. Mental auras, intense experience of emotion, Hypergraphia between attacks, the tendency to read and write compulsively and at great length. Intense enthusiasm, religious fervor, and aggression alternating with emotional dependency are all symptoms related to epilepsy. <clears throat> These same skip symptoms are attributed to the personality disorders associated with schizotypy. The list of names associated with one or both of these conditions is huge with regard to artists of note and includes Dostoevsky, Flaubert, Tennyson, Swinburne, Byron, de Maupassant, Moliere, uh, Pascal, Petrarch, uh, Dante, Poe, and Van Gogh. Epilepsy was once interpreted as a sign of divine intervention. Today, however, the management of epilepsy is handled scientifically with anticonvulsants. Despite the intervention of science, the question of whether drugs should be denied epileptics for the sake of their creative output does not occur because denial of medicine for this condition would be considered cruel. <clears throat> Societal consensus 
is concerned with maintaining the full range of human emotions, as in the case of depression. But this point of view would wish for the eradication of epilepsy and personality disorders or any alternate view of reality without consideration for these conditions' potential benefits to human creativity, according to Kramer, 2005. The Enigmatic Artist and the Imaginary Invalid The mystique of the suffering artist is one that goes along with the mystique of the eccentric artist. Susan Sontag explored the idealization of tuberculosis in her essay, Illness as Metaphor, when still a mystery to science as to causes, diagnosis, and treatment the disease was attributed with many of the characteristics also given to artists. Recklessness, longing, sensuality, serenity, decadence, se sensitivity, glamour, resignation, instinct, instinctual renunciation, passion or passion repressed, i.e. a disease of sensitive or refined creatures. But as science learned that TB was merely a variant of pneumonia, these romantic associations began to cease entirely, becoming finally unremarkable. Could the central question of a correlation between illness and creative pursuits originate from the same source as this idealization of the romantic invalid? Conclusion, the usefulness of artistic difference. When viewing the history of arts, it is very easy to fall into hypothesizing as to a diagnosis of famous artists drawn from episodes recorded for posterity. However, it is impossible to confirm a diagnosis of Van Gogh's unusual food cravings or Michelangelo's gout. Although we could be convinced of Edvard Munch's seasonal affective disorder, what good would it this do the future of the arts? My proposal is that art historians owe more to the wor art world than critiques, measurements, and facts, or the charting of terminology and philosophy. Science is charting the creative mind through studies showing the interaction between both hemispheres to come up with novel associations, leading to theories about the origins and an expansion of creative thought, according to Foley, 2005. It is my hope that these new studies will endorse an approach to both making and understanding artistic endeavors. I hope that in the future, artistic thinking will be less seen as either a square peg in a round hole world or as less of a tradesman's craft to be formulaically emulated. I see this as occurring through allowing for the enhancement of structured communicative opportunities for those devoted to the arts, developing curriculum specifically for the enhancement of mental and sensory development, and continuing to stay current with research from all fields concerning the nature of human perception and its implementation in education. This approach would be equivalent to the changes in early childhood education incorporating Montessori techniques of hands-on learning or theater using method acting. I believe wholeheartedly that art history would be much more relevant and serve a larger portion of the population if these potential avenues were followed through and realized further.
And with that, I bid you good day. This paper cited authors such as Peter Kramer, Hans Eisenk, uh, Stephen Koslin, and Brad Foley. I truly appreciate you joining me here at Mystic Ashram, and I hope that this uh, presentation has helped you a great deal. This is just the beginning of studying the Corpus Colossum and uh, the managing of the two hemispheres of the brain, and I hope to do that far more here at Mystic Ashram in the future. So thank you so much for joining me, um, and till next time, many blessings.